Vladimir Lenin. The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky. What is internationalism? Kautsky is absolutely convinced that he is an internationalist and calls himself one. The shade mans he calls government socialists. In defending the Mensheviks, he does not openly express his solidarity with them, but he faithfully expresses their views, Kautsky has shown with perfect clarity what kind of internationalism he subscribes to. And since Kautsky is not alone, but is spokesman for a trend which inevitably grew up in the atmosphere of the Second International, Longwet in France, Turati in Italy, Nobbs and Grimm, Graeber and Name in Switzerland, Ramsey MacDonald in Britain, etc., it will be instructive to dwell on Kautsky's internationalism. After emphasizing that the Mensheviks also attended the Zimmerwald Conference, a diploma, certainly, but, a tainted one, Kautsky sets forth the views of the Mensheviks, with whom he agrees, in the following manner. The Mensheviks wanted a general peace. They wanted all the belligerents to adopt the formula, no annexations and no indemnities. Until this had been achieved, the Russian army, according to this view, was to stand ready for battle. The Bolsheviks, on the other hand, demanded an immediate peace at any price, they were prepared, if need be, to make a separate peace, they tried to force it by increasing the state of disorganization of the army, which was already bad enough, p27. In Kautsky's opinion the Bolsheviks should not have taken power, and should have contented themselves with a constituent assembly. So, the internationalism of Kautsky and the Mensheviks amounts to this, to demand reforms from the imperialist bourgeois government, but to continue to support it, and to continue to support the war that this government is waging until everyone in the war has accepted the formula, no annexations and no indemnities. This view was repeatedly expressed by Durati, and by the Kautsky supporters, Haas and others, and by Longwet and Co., who declared that they stood for defense of the fatherland. Theoretically, this shows a complete inability to dissociate oneself from the social chauvinists and complete confusion on the question of defense of the fatherland. Politically, it means substituting petty bourgeois nationalism for internationalism, deserting to the reformists' camp and renouncing revolution. From the point of view of the proletariat, recognizing defense of the fatherland means justifying the present war, admitting that it is legitimate. And since the war remains an imperialist war, both under a monarchy and under a republic, irrespective of the country mine or some other country in which the enemy troops are stationed at the given moment, recognizing defense of the fatherland means, in fact, supporting the imperialist, predatory bourgeoisie, and completely betraying socialism. In Russia, even under Kerensky, under the bourgeois democratic republic, the war continued to be imperialist war, for it was being waged by the bourgeoisie as a ruling class, and war is a continuation of politics, and a particularly striking expression of the imperialist character of the war were the secret treaties for the partitioning of the world and the plunder of other countries which had been concluded by the Tsar at the time with the capitalists of Britain and France. The Mensheviks deceived the people in a most despicable manner by calling this war a defensive or revolutionary war. And by approving the policy of the Mensheviks, Kautsky is approving the popular deception, is approving the part played by the petty bourgeoisie in helping capital to trick the workers and harness them to the chariot of the imperialists. Kautsky is pursuing a characteristically petty bourgeois, philistine policy by pretending, and trying to make the people believe the absurd idea, that putting forward a slogan alters the position. The entire history of bourgeois democracy refutes this illusion, the bourgeois democrats have always advanced all sorts of slogans to deceive the people. The point is to test their sincerity, to compare their words with their deeds, not to be satisfied with idealistic or charlatan phrases, but to get down to class reality. An imperialist war does not cease to be imperialist when charlatans or phrase mongers or petty bourgeois philistines put forward sentimental slogans, but only when the class which is conducting the imperialist war, and is bound to it by millions of economic threads, and even ropes, is really overthrown and is replaced at the helm of state by the really revolutionary class, the proletariat. There is no other way of getting out of an imperialist war, 
as also out of an imperialist predatory peace. By approving the foreign policy of the Menslivics, and by declaring it to be internationalist and Zimmerwaldist, Kautsky, first, reveals the utter rottenness of the opportunist Zimmerwald majority, no wonder we, the left Zimmerwaldists, at once dissociated ourselves from such a majority. And, secondly and this is the chief thing passes from the position of the proletariat to the position of the petty bourgeoisie, from the revolutionary to the reformist. The proletariat fights for the revolutionary overthrow of the imperialist bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie fights for the reformist improvement of imperialism, for adaptation to it, while submitting to it. When Kautsky was still a Marxist, for example, in 1909, when he wrote his Road to Power, it was the idea that war would inevitably lead to revolution that he advocated, and he spoke of the approach of an era of revolutions. The Baal Manifesto of 1912 plainly and definitely speaks of a proletarian revolution in connection with that very imperialist war between the German and the British groups which actually broke out in 1914. But in 1918, when revolutions did begin in connection with the war, Kautsky, instead of explaining that they were inevitable, instead of pondering over and thinking out the revolutionary tactics and the ways and means of preparing for revolution, began to describe the reformist tactics of the Mensheviks as internationalism. Isn't this apostasy? Kautsky praises the Mensheviks for having insisted on maintaining the fighting strength of the army, and he blames the Bolsheviks for having added to disorganization of the army, which was already disorganized enough as it was. This means praising reformism and submission to the imperialist bourgeoisie, and blaming and renouncing revolution. For under Kerensky maintaining the fighting strength of the army meant its preservation under bourgeois, albeit republican, command. Everybody knows, and the progress of events has strikingly confirmed it, that this republican army preserved the Karnilov spirit because its officers were Karnilov men. The bourgeois officers could not help being Karnilov men, they could not help gravitating towards imperialism and towards the forcible suppression of the proletariat. All that the Menshevik tactics amounted to in practice was to leave all the foundations of the imperialist war and all the foundations of the bourgeois dictatorship intact, to patch up details and to dog over a few trifles, reforms. On the other hand, not a single great revolution has ever taken place, or ever can take place, without the disorganization of the army. For the army is the most ossified instrument for supporting the old regime, the most hardened bulwark of bourgeois discipline, buttressing up the rule of capital, and preserving and fostering among the working people the servile spirit of submission and subjection to capital. Counter-revolution has never tolerated, and never could tolerate, armed workers side by side with the army. In France, Engels wrote, the workers emerged armed from every revolution, therefore, the disarming of the workers was the first commandment for the bourgeoisie, who were at the helm of the state. See footnote 30, the armed workers were the embryo of a new army, the organized nucleus of a new social order. The first commandment of the bourgeoisie was to crush this nucleus and prevent it from growing. The first commandment of every victorious revolution, as Marx and Engels repeatedly emphasized, was to smash the old army, dissolve it and replace it by a new one. See footnote 31, a new social class, when rising to power, never could, and cannot now, attain power and consolidate it except by completely disintegrating the old army, disorganization the reactionary or just cowardly Philistines howl on this score, except by passing through a most difficult and painful period without any army. The Great French Revolution also passed through such a painful period, and by gradually building up, in the midst of hard civil war, a new army, a new discipline, a new military organization of the new class. Formerly, Kautsky the historian understood this. Now, Kautsky the renegade has forgotten it. What right has Kautsky to call the shade man's government socialists if he approves of the tactics of the Mensheviks in the Russian Revolution? In supporting Kerenchi and joining his ministry, the Mensheviks were also government socialists. Kautsky could not escape this conclusion if he were to put the question as to which is the ruling class that is waging the imperialist war. But Kautsky avoids raising the question about the ruling class, 
a question that is imperative for a Marxist, for the mere raising of it would expose the renegade. The Kautsky supporters in Germany, the Longwet supporters in France, and Turati and Co. in Italy argue in this way, socialism presupposes the equality and freedom of nations, their self-determination, hence, when our country is attacked, or when enemy troops invade our territory, it is the right and duty of socialists to defend their country. But theoretically such an argument is either a sheer mockery of socialism or a fraudulent subterfuge, while from the point of view of practical politics it coincides with the argument of the quite ignorant country yokel who has even no conception of the social, class character of the war, and owe the tasks owe a revolutionary party during a reactionary war. Socialism is opposed to violence against nations. That is indisputable. But socialism is opposed to violence against men in general. Apart from Christian anarchists and Tolstoyales, however, no one has yet drawn the conclusion from this that socialism is opposed to revolutionary violence. So, to talk about violence in general, without examining the conditions which distinguish reactionary from revolutionary violence, means being a Philistine who renounces revolution, or else it means simply deceiving oneself and others by sophistry. The same holds true of violence against nations. Every war is violence against nations, but that does not prevent socialists from being in favor of a revolutionary war. The class character of war that is the fundamental question which confronts a socialist, if lie is not a renegade. The imperialist war of 1914-18 is a war between two groups of the imperialist bourgeoisie for the division of the world, for the division of the booty, and for the plunder and strangulation of small and weak nations. This was the appraisal of the impending war given in the Baal Manifesto in 1912, and it has been confirmed by the facts. Whoever departs from this view of war is not a socialist. If a German under Wilhelm or a Frenchman under Clemenceau says, it is my right and duty as a socialist to defend my country if it is invaded by an enemy, Lie argues not like a socialist, not like an internationalist, not like a revolutionary proletarian, but like a petty bourgeois nationalist. Because this argument ignores the revolutionary class struggle of the workers against capital, it ignores the appraisal of the war as a whole from the point of view of the world bourgeoisie and the world proletariat, that is, it ignores internationalism, and all that remains is miserable and narrow-minded nationalism. My country is being wronged, that is all I care about that is what this argument amounts to, and that is where its petty bourgeois, nationalist narrow-mindedness lies. It is the same as if in regard to individual violence, violence against an individual, one were to argue that socialism is opposed to violence and therefore I would rather be a traitor than go to prison. The Frenchman, German or Italian who says, socialism is opposed to violence against nations, therefore I defend myself when my country is invaded, betrays socialism and internationalism, because such a man sees only his own country, he puts his own, bourgeoisie above everything else and does not give a thought to the international connections which make the war an imperialist war and his bourgeoisie a link in the chain of imperialist plunder. All Philistines and all stupid and ignorant yokels argue in the same way as the renegade Kautsky supporters, Longwet supporters, Turati and Co., the enemy has invaded my country, I don't care about anything else see footnote 32. The socialist, the revolutionary proletarian, the internationalist, argues differently. He says, the character of the war, whether it is reactionary or revolutionary, does not depend on who the attacker was, or in whose country the enemy is stationed, it depends on what class is waging the war, and on what politics this war is a continuation of. If the war is a reactionary, imperialist war, that is, if it is being waged by two world groups of the imperialist, rapacious, predatory, reactionary bourgeoisie, then every bourgeoisie, even of the smallest country, becomes a participant in the plunder, and my duty as a representative of the revolutionary proletariat is to prepare for the world proletarian revolution as the only escape from the horrors of a world slaughter. I must argue, not from the point of view of my country, for that is the argument of a wretched, stupid, petty bourgeois nationalist who does not realize that he is only a plaything in the hands of the imperialist bourgeoisie, 
but from the point of view of my share in th preparation, in the propaganda, and in the acceleration of the world proletarian revolution. That is what internationalism means, and that is the duty of the internationalist, the revolutionary worker, the genuine socialist. That is the ABC that Kautsky the renegade has forgotten. And his apostasy becomes still more obvious when he passes from approving the tactics of the petty bourgeois nationalists, the Mensheviks in Russia, the Longwet supporters in France, the Duratis in Italy, and Haas and Co. in Germany, to criticizing the Bolshevik tactics. Here is his criticism. The Bolshevik revolution was based on the assumption that it would become the starting point of a general European I evolution, that the bold initiative of Russia would prompt the proletarians of all Europe to rise. On this assumption it was, of course, immaterial what forms the Russian separate peace would take, what hardships and territorial losses, literally, nihilation or maiming, Verstamlungen, it would cause the Russian people, and what interpretation of the self-determination of nations it would give. At that time it was also immaterial whether Russia was able to defend herself or not. According to this view, the European Revolution would be the best protection of the Russian Revolution, and would bring complete and genuine self-determination to all peoples inhabiting the former Russian territory. A revolution in Europe, which would establish and consolidate socialism there, would also become the means of removing the obstacles that would arise in Russia in the way of the introduction of the socialist system of production owing to the economic backwardness of the country. All this was very logical and very suited only if the main assumption were granted, namely, that the Russian Revolution would infallibly let loose a European Revolution. But what if that did not happen? So far the assumption has not been justified. And the proletarians of Europe are now being accused of having abandoned and betrayed the Russian Revolution. This is an accusation leveled against unknown persons, for who is to be held responsible for the behavior of the European proletariat. P28. And Kautsky then goes on to explain at great length that Marx, Engels and Babel were more than once mistaken about the advent of revolution they had anticipated, but that they never based their tactics on the expectation of a revolution at a definite date, P29, whereas, he says, the Bolsheviks staked everything on one card, on a general European revolution. We have deliberately quoted this long passage to demonstrate to our readers Kautsky's skill in counterfeiting Marxism by palming off his banal and reactionary Philistine view in its stead. First, to ascribe to an opponent an obviously stupid idea and then to refute it is a trick practiced by none too clever people. If the Bolsheviks had based their tactics on the expectation of a revolution in other countries by a definite date that would have been an undeniable stupidity. But the Bolshevik party has never been guilty of such stupidity. In my letter to American workers, August 20, 1918, I expressly disown this foolish idea by saying that we count on an American revolution, but not by any definite date. I dwelt at length upon the very same idea more than once in my controversy with the left socialist revolutionaries and the left communists, January March 1918. Kautsky has committed a slight, just a very slight forgery, on which he in fact based his criticism of Bolshevism. Kautsky has confused tactics based on the expectation of a European revolution in the more or less near future, but not at a definite date, with tactics based on the expectation of a European revolution at a definite date. A slight, just a very slight forgery. The last named tactics are foolish. The first named are obligatory for a Marxist, for every revolutionary proletarian and internationalist obligatory, because they alone take into account in a proper Marxist way the objective situation brought about by the war in all European countries, and they alone conform to the international tasks of the proletariat. By substituting the petty question about an error which the Bolshevik revolutionaries might have made, but did not, for the important question of the foundations of revolutionary tactics in general, Kautsky adroitly abjures all revolutionary tactics. A renegade in politics, he is unable even to present the question of the objective prerequisites of revolutionary tactics theoretically. And this brings us to the second point. Secondly, 
it is obligatory for a Marxist to count on a European revolution if a revolutionary situation exists. It is the ABC of Marxism that the tactics of the socialist proletariat cannot be the same both when there is a revolutionary situation and when there is no revolutionary situation. If Kautsky had put this question, which is obligatory for a Marxist, he would have seen that the answer was absolutely against him. Long before the war, all Marxists, all socialists were agreed that a European war would create a revolutionary situation. Kautsky himself, before he became a renegade, clearly and definitely recognized this in 1902, in his social revolution, and in 1909, in his road to power. It was also admitted in the name of the entire Second International in the Ball Manifesto. No wonder the social chauvinists and Kautsky supporters, the centrists, i.e., those who waver between the revolutionaries and the opportunists, of all countries shun like the plague the declarations of the Ball Manifesto on this score. So, the expectation of a revolutionary situation in Europe was not an infatuation of the Bolsheviks, but the general opinion of all Marxists. When Kautsky tries to escape from this indisputable truth using such phrases as the Bolsheviks always believed in the omnipotence of violence and will, he simply utters a sonorous and empty phrase to cover up his evasion, a shameful evasion, to put the question of a revolutionary situation. To proceed. Has a revolutionary situation actually come or not? Kautsky proved unable to put this question either. The economic facts provide an answer, the famine and ruin created everywhere by the war imply a revolutionary situation. The political facts also provide an answer, ever since 1915 a splitting process has been evident in all countries within the old and decayed socialist parties, a process of departure of the mass of the proletariat from the social chauvinist leaders to the left, to revolutionary ideas and sentiments, to revolutionary leaders. Only a person who dreads revolution and betrays it could have failed to see these facts on August 5, 1918, when Kautsky was writing his pamphlet. And now, at the end of October 1918, the revolution is growing in a number of European countries, and growing under everybody's eyes and very rapidly at that. Kautsky the revolutionary, who still wants to be regarded as a Marxist, has proved to be a short-sighted Philistine, who, like those Philistines of 1847 whom Marx ridiculed, failed to see the approaching revolution. Now to the third point. Thirdly, what should be the specific features of revolutionary tactics when there is a revolutionary situation in Europe? Having become a renegade, Kautsky feared to put this question, which is obligatory for a Marxist. Kautsky argues like a typical petty bourgeois, a Philistine, or like an ignorant peasant, has a general European revolution begun or not? If it has, then he too is prepared to become a revolutionary. But then, mark you, Every scoundrel, like the scoundrels who now sometimes attach themselves to the victorious Bolsheviks, would proclaim himself a revolutionary. If it has not, then Kautsky will turn his back on revolution. Kautsky does not display a shade of understanding of the truth that a revolutionary Marxist differs from the Philistine and petty bourgeois by his ability to preach to the uneducated masses that the maturing revolution is necessary, to prove that it is inevitable to explain its benefits to the people, and to prepare the proletariat and all the working and exploited people for it. Kautsky ascribed to the Bolsheviks an absurdity, namely, that they had staked everything on one card, on a European revolution breaking out at a definite date. This absurdity has turned against Kautsky himself, because the logical conclusion of his argument is that the tactics of the Bolsheviks would have been correct if a European revolution had broken out by August 5th. 1918. That is the date Kautsky mentions as the time he was writing his pamphlet. And when, a few weeks after this August 5th, it became clear that revolution was coming in a number of European countries, the whole apostasy of Kautsky, his whole falsification of Marxism, and his utter inability to reason or even to present questions in a revolutionary manner, became revealed in all their charm. When the proletarians of Europe are accused of treachery, Kautsky writes, it is an accusation leveled at unknown persons. You are mistaken, Mr. Kautsky. 
Look in the mirror and you will see those unknown persons against whom this accusation is leveled. Kautsky assumes an air of naivete and pretends not to understand who leveled the accusation, and its meaning. In reality, however, Kautsky knows perfectly well that the accusation has been and is being leveled by the German lefts, by the Spartacists, by Liebknecht and his friends. This accusation expresses a clear appreciation of the fact that the German proletariat betrayed the Russian, and world, revolution when it strangled Finland, the Ukraine, Latvia and Estonia. This accusation is leveled primarily and above all, not against the masses, who are always downtrodden, but against those leaders who, like the Shademans and the Kautskys, failed in their duty to carry on revolutionary agitation, revolutionary propaganda, revolutionary work among the masses to overcome their inertness, who in fact worked against the revolutionary instincts and aspirations which are always aglow deep down among the mass of the oppressed class. The shade mans bluntly, crudely, cynically, and in most cases for selfish motives betrayed the proletariat and deserted to the side of the bourgeoisie. The Kautsky and the Longwet supporters did the same thing, only hesitatingly and haltingly, and casting cowardly side glances at those who were stronger at the moment. In all his writings during the war Kautsky tried to extinguish the revolutionary spirit instead of fostering and fanning it. The fact that Kautsky does not even understand the enormous theoretical importance, and the even greater agitational and propaganda importance, of the accusation that the proletarians of Europe have betrayed the Russian Revolution will remain a veritable historical monument to the Philistine stupefaction of the average leader of German official social democracy. Kautsky does not understand that, owing to the censorship prevailing in the German Reich, this accusation is perhaps the only form in which the German socialists who have not betrayed socialism Liebknecht and his friends can express their appeal to the German workers to throw off the Shademans and the Kautskys, to push aside such leaders, to free themselves from their stultifying and debasing propaganda, to rise in revolt in spite of them, without them, and march over their heads. Towards Revolution Kautsky does not understand this. And how could he understand the tactics of the Bolsheviks? Can a man who renounces revolution in general be expected to weigh and appraise the conditions of the development of revolution in one of the most difficult cases? The Bolsheviks' tactics were correct, they were the only internationalist tactics, because they were based, not on the cowardly fear of a world revolution, not on a Philistine lack of faith in it, not on the narrow nationalist desire to protect one's own fatherland, the fatherland of one's own bourgeoisie, while not giving a damn about all the rest, but on a correct, and, before the war and before the apostasy of the social chauvinists and social pacifists, a universally accepted estimation of the revolutionary situation in Europe. These tactics were the only internationalist tactics, because they did the utmost possible in one country for the development, support and awakening of the revolution in all countries. These tactics have been justified by their enormous success, for Bolshevism, not by any means because of the merits of the Russian Bolsheviks, but because of the most profound sympathy of the people everywhere for tactics that are revolutionary in practice, has become world Bolshevism, has produced an idea, a theory, a program and tactics which differ concretely and in practice from those of social chauvinism and social pacifism. Bolshevism has given a coup de grace to the old, decayed international of the Shademans and Kautskys, Renaudels and Longwets, Hendersons and McDonalds, who from now on will be treading on each other's feet, dreaming about unity and trying to revive a corpse. Bolshevism has created the ideological and tactical foundations of a third international, of a really proletarian and communist international, which will take into consideration both the gains of the tranquil epoch and the experience of the epoch of revolutions, which has begun. Bolshevism has popularized throughout the world the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat, has translated these words from the Latin, first into Russian, and then into all the languages of the world, and has shown by the example of Soviet government that the workers and poor peasants, even of a backward country, even with the least experience, education and habits of organization, have been able for a whole year, amidst gigantic difficulties and amidst a struggle against the exploiters. 
who were supported by the bourgeoisie of the whole world, to maintain the power of the working people, to create a democracy that is immeasurably higher and broader than all previous democracies in the world, and to the creative work of tens of millions of workers and peasants for the practical construction of socialism. Bolshevism has actually helped to develop the proletarian revolution in Europe and America more powerfully than any party in any other country has so far succeeded in doing. While the workers of the whole world are realizing more and more clearly every day that the tactics of the Shademans and Kautskys have not delivered them from the imperialist war and from wage slavery to the imperialist bourgeoisie, and that these tactics cannot serve as a model for all countries, the mass of workers in all countries are realizing more and more clearly every day that Bolshevism has indicated the right road of escape from the horrors of war and imperialism, that Bolshevism can serve as a model of tactics for all. Not only the general European, but the world proletarian revolution is maturing before the eyes of all, and it has been assisted, accelerated and supported by the victory of the proletariat in Russia. All this is not enough for the complete victory of socialism, you say? Of course it is not enough. One country alone cannot do more. But this one country, thanks to Soviet government, has done so much that even if Soviet government in Russia were to be crushed by world imperialism tomorrow, as a result, let us say, of an agreement between German and Anglo-French imperialism even granted that very worst possibility it would still be found that Bolshevik tactics have brought enormous benefit to socialism and have assisted the growth of the invincible world revolution. End notes. 30 Lenin quotes from Engels's introduction to Karl Marx's The Civil War in France, Marx and Engels, Selected Works, Moscow, 1962, Volume I, p. 475. 31 Karl Marx, The Civil War in France, Marx and Engels, Selected Works, Moscow, 1962, Volume I, pages 518-19. 32 The Social Chauvinists, The Shade Mans, Renaudels, Lender Sons, Gompers's and Co., absolutely refused to talk about the nine anti international during the war. They regard the enemies of their respective bourgeoisies as traitors to socialism. They support the policy of conquest pursued by their respective bourgeoisies. The social pacifists, i.e., socialists in words and petty bourgeois pacifists in practice, express all sorts of internationalist sentiments protest against annexations, etc., but in practice they continue to support their respective imperialist bourgeoisies. The difference between the two types is unimportant, it is like the difference between two capitalists one with bitter, and the other with sweet, words on his lips.